So today's video is all about taking that incredible 360 footage from your Insta360 X3 and editing it on your computer using the Insta360 Studio app. Now, the great thing about this app from Insta360 is it is completely free. And my favorite use of the Insta360 Studio app is to reframe that footage and to then put that reframed footage into your favorite video editing program to tell your story. So what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna do a full demonstration from start to finish of how to edit several clips. And I'm going to show the different tools that the Insta360 Studio app has available to you for reframing that footage and some pretty cool functionality in there that's gonna make it a lot easier and give you better results. So first thing we're gonna to do today is I'm gonna hook up the X3 to my computer and we're gonna copy off the files. So to hook it up, you can either take out your micro SD card if you have an SD or micro SD card slot and you can use an adapter or you can just plug in a USB to USB-C cable and you can hook it up and copy off your files that way. I'm going to hook in the cable and copy them off that way. We're gonna plug it in here. So after you plug it in, you're gonna to wanna to power on the camera. And once you power it on, you should see the camera show up here on your computer. And if it doesn't show up on your computer at first, power it on and then plug in the USB cable. And then typically it'll work at that point. So after I plug it in, it's gonna detect it here in my computer. And it's usually gonna say USB drive. And within that drive, we're gonna to go to DCIM, camera one. And I'm going to do control A to select all of these files. And then I'm gonna do control C to copy them. And then we're gonna to go to our directory where we want to copy them. So I've already created an empty folder that's entitled Insta360X3 Clips. So we're gonna do Control V to paste them there, or you can right click and select paste. And we're gonna let the files copy. And it is important to select all to get all of the files on there. There are some preview files that are not going to be needed when you export your footage but they are needed in order to properly view this and work with these files here. All right, and once our files have finished copying, I'm going to power my camera back off and we're gonna disconnect it. It's a good practice to power it back off and not have it sitting around open like that because as you know, with 360 cameras, the lenses here that stick out, if those are to fall and hit my desk or hit the metal frame of the computer, they could easily get scratched. So what I like to do when I'm done copying the files, I like to put it right back into its pouch here to keep those lenses safe. All right, now that our files have finished copying here, we're gonna immediately go to the Insta360 Studio app and get that open. And by the way, this software can be used on Mac as well. So if you have Mac OS, you can use the Studio software on there. This is not just a Windows only thing. And once our software is open, we're gonna go here to where it says open and we're gonna make sure we've selected our correct folder. We're gonna do control A and we're gonna click open and it's gonna import all of our files. And the great thing about the Insta360 Studio app is it takes the footage from each lens and it stitches it together into a 360 video automatically. So your footage is all here, ready for you to look around and to figure out how you're gonna reframe it. So let's start with this first clip here. This will be uh, clip number four. There's about a minute and four seconds of footage there. So first thing I'm gonna do here right away is I'm just gonna click play so that you can see how this looks. Now, what I was doing at the start of this frame is I actually had the invisible selfie stick and I had the long version of that. So I was getting my camera way up into the air, which is really cool. That selfie stick, when you can lift it up that high, it feels like you have a drone there flying over you. Gives you so much extra flexibility and I really like that. So that is pretty cool. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop that. I'm gonna click here back at the beginning. It's gonna automatically move the timeline placement back to the beginning. One of the key things you wanna know when you're reframing your footage is you want to use your keyframes properly. So when you set a keyframe, what you can do is you can click that, you can drag this around, and let's say we set the keyframe right there. You then can choose default, crystal ball, tiny planet, or natural view. So default is what we see right there. Crystal ball is this little uh, circular feature here, 
I generally don't find myself using Crystal Ball, but if that's the effect you want to go for. Tiny Planet, of course, you've probably seen this. So if you're curious how to get that feature, that is the Tiny Planet right there. You can turn it every which way, figure out how you want it to look. Pretty cool. And then Natural View, of course, that's going to make it uh, more of a linear cropped view. So the default view is generally the one that I like to go with, and that's kind of a wider angle view. So your resulting footage that you export, it's gonna have that wider angle look to it. But I like having that with this camera. That's the type of perspective I like best. And you can of course change these values as well. So if you go back here and click on the keyframe, uh, you can go up here, you can change the pan angle, you can change the tilt angle. And a helpful trick here, you don't have to type in values. If you click on it, you can drag left and right to pan it. So that's kind of a time saver there. You don't have to type in like, oh, I wanna to go to 20 degrees or I wanna to go to 30. You know, you can just drag this side to side much faster to do it that way. Uh, the same thing with the angle this way. But I'm going to go back here and click default and I'm going to have it do the default there. And distortion control, this of course you can do the same thing. So you can zoom it out, you can crop it in. Uh, when you go down to zero, that's gonna make it truly linear there, almost narrow. So when you do that, that's gonna kind of get rid of the distortion. That tree actually is <laughs> crooked and leans like that. Uh, that's realistic there. It looks like fisheye, but it's not. And then of course you can do the roll angle here if you wanna do any of that. Lost a zero key. Guess I used that zero key a little too much. But let's put this back to zero here. And once we have decided on our keyframe, we're going to put this arrow back down and then we're gonna play this a little bit. So this is where keyframes can work if you want to have movement or transition in the footage. And we're gonna add another keyframe. So let's turn this side to side and let's have it facing the opposite direction. And then for the tilt angle, let's have it looking down on myself and my son. Let's have it end up someplace like that. So now what happens is your Insta360 Studio app, it draws a yellow line between these two keyframes. So let me demonstrate what it does here. Let's click the cursor back here to the beginning. And I'm gonna click play here. And so check this out. What it does is it starts playing the footage, but as this goes, it does a pan around and it changes the angle. So we're panning side to side and down and up to down to reframe that. And of course, once your keyframe goes by, it's going to stick with whatever value you had last for your keyframe. So in this case, it's gonna have that perspective. So that's how you do keyframes. Basically, you have a start point and then you have an end point. And the software is going to do the rest for you. All right, so let's say you wanna take more of a automated approach to that. Let's say you want to have your subject always framed. I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna remove these keyframes and I'm gonna show you how to do that. So if you wanna remove it, all you have to do is click on it and then click the X here at the bottom. We'll do the same thing here. And it's gonna start us back at the default clean slate there. So what I'm gonna do first is I wanna figure out what I want this to track. So in this case, let's have this track my son. I want it to track my son here as he moves along. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna click deep track. And I accidentally selected myself. So we're gonna go up to edit and undo. And let's try that one more time. I'm gonna go back around here and we're gonna go here to deep track and it'll offer you multiple subjects. So in this case, it has two targets here. I would just like to track my son at this point so I'm gonna click on him and it's gonna automatically start tracking him. So we can let this roll as long as we want to. In this case, I'm gonna let it go for about 30 seconds to see what it does with tracking him. Oh, 
All right, so let's stop the tracking in a little bit here. I'm obviously running with the uh, X3 at that point. He's running behind me. So I'm gonna click stop there. Now let's go back and see what it did with the tracking. So we're gonna go back to the start and we're gonna click play. It's got a nice high perspective tracking him. And he of course ran off to the side there. So the camera kept him near the center and he is of course running now. So if you've ever used a drone with a AI tracking mode on it where it tracks a subject that you set, this is basically like that. It's very cool. And of course, once the tracking aspect's done, it's going to continue with the framing that it ended with, just like that. Now, let's go to the next mode here, which is time shift. So you can, of course, do time shift on your camera, but oftentimes I like to do a video file and then you can use time shift later on because you have a lot more flexibility when doing it that way. So if we click on time shift here, let's say we want to do a time shift of about the first 41 seconds here. So motion blur is on, it tells us for two times and above speed, it will show that only in post-production. So for this, we're gonna just pick our framing and we're gonna click play here. So right now, this is in two times speed, which really is not that fast. We're gonna generally wanna go a little bit faster. So I'm gonna click pause. In order to do it faster, what we wanna do is we wanna click on this and it's gonna bring up this bar here. So for time shift, I usually like to do at least eight times. And it's gonna tell you this, uh, that it's gonna do the speed ramping after exporting, uh, but I'm going to do eight times the speed there and let's take a look at it now. So it's gonna have really nice motion blur when you export it. And for this clip, I will keep that so you can see what that looks like. It does look very cool and it does a great job with it. So with this particular clip, I think I wanna go even faster than eight times, but I don't want it to start at the very beginning because that's when I was getting my selfie stick way up into the air after I'd hit record. So I wanna actually drag this right here and it's going to have it not start until I have it up in the air. And in this case, I actually wanna go a little bit faster. I wanna do 16 times, but then I wanna drag this a little bit further out. So we're gonna drag it to about there and we're gonna hit play. And right now it's gonna look a little rough on there, but it's going to look better when we export it. And what I wanna do here, let's say I wanna mark this as my trim end. What it's gonna do is it's gonna take all of the rest of the footage that was left in this clip and it's going to trim it out. Here we've already marked it as the start because I've already dragged it left to right. But if we wanted to mark it as the trim start, I could have done that as well. So stabilization type, flow state stabilization is turned on automatically. Stitching is generally going to be normal here unless you do have the sticky lens guard on or some type of dive case. So we're gonna keep all of these selected by default. And I filmed with log mode. So you have a couple options. You can do the color correcting here, which is kind of more of an automated feature, or you can wait to do it later on when you're editing your reframe clips. If you do the color here, you can add the color plus, you can add the clarity plus, or you can do the AquaVision 2.0, which is generally gonna be if you did underwater clip. So if you wanna do the color plus, I find that that really almost does too much for my liking, so I don't like to do that here. The clarity plus looks a little bit better, but I still generally don't recommend doing that here. I think you can get a lot better results in most editing programs. If you have Premiere Pro especially, Premiere Pro does a great job with editing, I love it. There's a lot of options, but you can also put these into DaVinci Resolve, and DaVinci Resolve is a great free option, especially for doing the color correcting and other such aspects. So I'm gonna click no to those at this point. And then there are logo options. You can add a logo here. It's gonna offer you those. I generally do none. I'm gonna keep that off. So what I wanna do is I want to click this button to start the export. I wanna show you the time shift effect on this particular clip. 
and then we'll go through some other clips and I'll show you a few more features you can combine before exporting them. So we're gonna go here to export. So the first thing we want to do is we want to make sure it's exporting to the place we want it to. In this case, I wanna put it in here, but I wanna put it in a subfolder and I'm gonna call this exported clips. So we're gonna click on that, select folder I'm fine with the default name because I'm going to import this into a video editor later on to finish telling my story with the clip. For the bit rate, I like to put this a little bit higher than the 25 default, even though it is 1080p. This is coming from an original 5.7K clip. That 360 degrees is 5.7K resolution. So I'm going to take the bit rate here and a lot of times 50 is going to be sufficient, but I like going a little bit higher. I like going to 100, especially if I'm going to put this footage into another project that may have footage with 100 bit rate. Even if my exporter project is not going to be 100, I like to keep it set high there. And for the encoding format, this is gonna depend on what you're editing with later on. If you're doing this on Apple, you'll probably want to use the ProRes 422. If you're doing it on Windows, I recommend H.264. And then we're ready to go. I'm gonna click Start Export. And it's gonna put it in our export queue over here. And it's going to show our percent progress. Depending on the hardware on your computer, that's gonna affect how quick this exports. But generally, even if it's an older type computer with not new hardware, generally the export's going to go pretty quickly and it's usually not gonna take very long. All right, so 100% is done there. And what I wanna do is I wanna show you a quick preview of that so you can see what it looks like. And this is our time shift clip. So you can see that there. Obviously I had a little bit of this going back and forth with the camera, so that was not an ideal clip to show that on, uh, but I think you get the idea with the motion blur. Very cool. So that is how you do a time shift clip. Let's go back and look at some of these other clips. For my next clip, I wanna pick a clip where it's got some darker, shadier footage and then some brighter, more lit footage. I feel like this could be a little bit more fun uh, to mess around with an edit. So in this case, I didn't have my camera all the way up. I had it up a little bit, but not even close to the maximum height it could go. By the way, I love the detail, like in those clouds there, that's really good detail. If you haven't seen my Insta360 best settings video, I definitely encourage you to check it out. I show you the best settings to help you get the best quality footage to edit later on. All right, so in this case, let's do a little bit of a complex cut here. First of all, let's create a keyframe and let's select the default view. Let's minimize this, but I'm gonna turn this so it faces my son and myself. And I'm gonna choose that approximate angle right there. So we're gonna click play here. And let's say I want it to go for about that distance right there. We're gonna add another keyframe there. And then let's say now I want it to do some deep tracking. And let's deep track myself. So we're gonna click deep track and we're gonna let it do the default there. We're gonna just let it do its thing. So at this point, I was talking to the camera. That's a perfect example of where you'd want to track it. Now the Insta360 X3 does have me mode on it, but if you use me mode, it basically does this within the camera, but you're not gonna have the same flexibility later on to edit that clip like you do in the app here. So that's one of the advantages of doing the 5.7K, and later on you can do your tracking to track yourself, which is great. So let's see how that did here. Yeah, so that was a really easy test case for it to do the deep track. It had no problems there tracking me. So let's do one more thing here. We're gonna go back to this keyframe and I'm gonna go ahead by a little bit here and I'm gonna set another keyframe. And with that keyframe, we're gonna reframe this for where we want it to end up. And let's have it end up as Tiny Planet just to show you what it can do with the transitions to get to that. So let's go back to our prior keyframe and let's click play. So what it's gonna do as I go along is it's going to rotate it and it's going to make it into Tiny Planet.
And of course, if you wanted to go to Tiny Planet quicker, all you have to do is put your keyframes closer together and it'll do so. And then after the keyframe ends, it of course stays at the default wherever the keyframe ended. So in this case, it ends with Tiny Planet. So it's still doing Tiny Planet. But those are the basics down here of how you reframe your footage. I wanted to go through those options. You could see what those are. You could do a lot of playing around and a lot of exploring. The software is pretty easy and it doesn't have a lot of options, but the options it does have are what you need to get your footage reframed properly before you edit it in other software. So some other things I wanted to show you here really quick is you do have aspect ratios you can select from. So if you wanted to do your footage one-to-one -one for certain social media platforms, you can do that. You can also do nine by 16. 9 by 16 of course, is great if you want to share a YouTube short. Great for that vertical resolution. So you could do 9 by 16 And then even after you do that, you can still drag it around and reframe it how you want to. And you also can do 4 by 3 You can do 235 to 1, which is going to be that classic cinematic aspect ratio. There are a lot of options in here. And also another thing I didn't mention. Uh, let me go back here and remove these keyframes before I show you that. You can do snapshot. So you can frame this however you want, and then you can take a picture. So let's say I wanted to take a picture right here, where I'm talking to the camera, right there. I can frame it, and then I can click Take Snapshot. And let's say I want to save it in here, in my exported clips. I'm gonna click Save and it's going to save a JPEG for us. So if I go in there now and select it, that is our snapshot right there. So I wanted to show you, if you do take off the stabilization, it is quite shaky. So I don't recommend taking off the stabilization here. The gyroscope data that's built into this camera is great. It can be really stabilized later on. And like the stabilization is really good. So there's really not a reason to not have flow state on. Now the audio is something I didn't show you earlier. You can do a voice focus, which is going to focus on the noise of the person talking. It's going to really enhance that voice if you want to. So it's up to you, that does work pretty well in here. But if you want to do that later on in whatever program you're editing in, you just wanna keep that unselected. You also can do noise reduction. I generally don't do noise reduction unless there's a really good reason because the capabilities to reduce noise in here are not as good as most video editing programs. So I usually I'll just keep that either set to off or voice focus. Generally, I keep it off though, because if I'm editing in Premiere Pro, I like to mess with that later on. And of course, project here, if you want to create a different project to work with these clips, you can do so. Generally, I just work from one project and I reframe and export all my clips as I have them. So we're gonna go here to start export. And by the way, you also can export the 360 degree video. And the advantage of that is the 360 video will be stitched together for you. So let's say you just wanted to take one of these clips and you wanted to export it as is to share it as 360. Maybe you didn't want to add any music to it. Uh, maybe you don't want to do any further editing. You just want to export it and share it as a 360 video. You can do that in here as well. And if you do choose to do that, I recommend keeping the default resolution here for best results. And for the bitrate, I recommend keeping the default that they have here as well of 119. There's not really a reason to change that. For your encoding format, generally you're gonna to wanna to export it as H.264. So if you want to do that, you can do that, it's great. I'm gonna add this to Q, so I can do the export of that as well to show you. And so let's do another export to add to Q, and this one is gonna be the reframed video. So for the bitrate again, I recommend changing it to approximately 100. And we of course will keep it at the 1920 by 1080, which by the way, the 1080p, you are exporting a reframed part of the overall 5.7K. But later on, if you wanna make that footage part of a project with a 2.7K or 4K resolution, you can upscale the 1080p footage to that resolution and it still looks good. Uh, it's quite usable. So when you export the 1080p, don't be concerned if you're gonna make it part of a 4K project, it still looks great.
So I'm gonna click here, add to queue, and we're gonna start exporting these. So I'm gonna go over here to the export queue. I'm gonna do control A. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna click start export. So it's gonna give us our progress down here. All right, so those are done exporting. I'm gonna close out of this. So that is how you use the Insta360 Studio app to reframe clips from the Insta360 X3. Hope you found this tutorial useful. Like I said, the program is not too complicated to learn. Play around with it a little bit. There's a lot of great functionality in there. Figure out what reframing options you like best for your footage with telling your story.